A fish and chips truck sells three kinds of fish, cod, haddock, and halibut. During a music festival, the truck sold 220 pieces of fish, of which 40% were haddock and 40% were halibut. How many pieces of cod did the truck sell? So we'll have cod, halibut, uh, or haddock, and halibut. And the total is 220, right? Now 40%, so 0 0.4 of 220. Uh, which is 88, is the haddock and halibut. So that we just have to solve for cod. And that equation is fairly straightforward. And when you do the math, you'll get C is 44. So there's 44 pieces of cod. If x over 2 minus 5 is 9, what is the value of 7x? Okay, so everything is under the square root sign. This is different than 7 times x. Okay, just keep that in mind. Don't make that mistake. Okay, so let's do this. So x over 2 minus 5 is 9. So that means x over 2 would be 14. And therefore, x would be 28. And then if we sub it in here, 7 times 28 square root. And then that's 196 square root. And the square root of 196 is 14. Point A has coordinates negative 13, negative 23, and B negative 33, negative 43. What is the slope of the line that is perpendicular to the line segment of AB? So two line segments, if they're perpendicular, their slopes are negative reciprocals. Negative reciprocals. So for example, if the first slope is, let's say, 2 over 3, the negative reciprocal of that would be 3 over 2, but with a negative. Got it? Okay. So let's figure out the first line, uh, rise over run, the standard rise over run. So minus 43, minus, minus 23, all over minus 33, minus, minus 13. So that'd be minus 20 over minus 20. So that's 1. So the negative 1 over 1, okay, interesting. Uh, the negative reciprocal of that would be 1 over 1 with a negative, which is just negative 1. So that is the final answer. What is the integer equal to? 119 squared minus 17 squared over 119 minus 17, and then we've got this 100 here. Okay, so this one I can factor. It'll just make things a little quicker if I do, like that. And then we got that 119 minus 17 and then minus 100. So when you do that, this cancels with that, and then we're just left with 119 plus 17 which I believe is 136. So 136 minus 100, and that's 36, and of course the square root of 36 is 6. P plus Q plus R is 70. P equals 2. Q, Q is 3R. What is the value of P? Okay, so since we want to solve for P, let's get everything in, in terms of P, and that will make it easy for us to solve. So P is already in terms of P. Q, using that, would be P over 2. And then r, well, that's going to take a little bit of work. q over 3 is r. And then q is p over 2, so it would be p over 2 over 3 is r. And that looks like p over 6. So there we go. we got everything in terms of p, and then now we can solve. So again, a common denominator, and that's going to make this 6 plus 3, 6p plus 3p plus p is 70. And that, I believe, is 10p. And 10p looks like uh, 70 times 6. Divide through by 10, we get 7 times 6, and therefore p is 42. How many ordered triples a, b, c of integers satisfy 1 less than or equal to a, less than b, less than c, less than or equal to d, uh, 10, <laughs> and b minus a is equal to c minus b? b minus a is equal to c minus b okay so let this b minus a let's just equal d for now so if b minus a is equal to d that means b is equal to d plus a okay and then this c minus b is also equal to d so c minus b equals d so therefore c is equal to d plus b but b, this b is d plus a, so we can go further and say d plus a, so c is equal to 2d plus a. So therefore, this triple, a, b, c, is really a, and then b is this guy, 
So it's a plus d. And c is this, so that's a plus 2d. So that looks kind of like an error. It is an arithmetic sequence. Okay. All right, great. But now we have to sort of take into consideration this uh, inequality here and then come up with values. And I, I really don't know if there's any way other than manually. I don't think there's a formula. That's okay. We can do it manually. What I mean by that is just plugging in values. So we start with 1. When d is 1, the order triple. Uh, well, a, the smallest it can be is 1. So we have 1, 2, and 3. And then when a is 2, it'll be 2, 3, and 4. And so on, right? And then we'll eventually get down to 8, 9, and 10. And that's the largest because this would be c, and c, the largest it can be is 10. So that exhausts when d is 1, and I believe that's 8. We got 8 such ordered triples. Now let's go to d equals 2. When d is 2, again, start with a equals 1, and we'll get 1, 3, and 5. And continuing in this way, you'll get up to 6, 8, and 10. And that's when it maxes out, because this cannot be greater than 10. So that's about as high as you can go, and that gives you another 6 order triples. And now let's go to d equals 3. That'll give me 1, 4, 7, and then eventually we'll get to 4, 7, 10. And that will give me 4. And I think we can keep going. D equals 4 will give me 1, 5, 9, and 2, 6, 10. And that gives me 2. And I have to, let's see what happens with D equals 5. It would be 1, 6, and 11. Oh, okay, so that is an invalid. So that's it. That's where we max out. So we got to add this 8, 6, 4, and 2. And when you add those guys up, you get a total of 20. The distinct prime factors of 18 are 2 and 3. What is the sum of all of the distinct prime factors of 4, 4, 6? 18 is equal to 2 to the power of 1 times 3 to the power of 2. So that's what they mean by distinct prime factors. So we have to do the same kind of thing to 4, 4, 4, 6. Okay, I think it's 2 times 3. You can use your calculator. Uh, 3, 13, and 19. So that's the full prime factorization of 4, 4, 4, 6. So it's 2 times 3 to the power of 2 times 13 times 19. So the prime factors are 2, 3, 13, and 19. And they want the sum of those guys. So we add them all up. And when you do, you get 37. Using the diagram below, a seven-digit integer can be created as follows. Trace a path that uses each line segment exactly once and use the labels on the line segments as digits. For example, the path that goes from C to A to B to C to E to B to D and finally to E gives the positive integer 3264715. What is the largest possible positive integer that can be created in this way? We have to experiment here. I don't think there's any magic. So... If I want the largest, perhaps it's a seven-digit number, right? So I would say I want my first digit to be the largest possible, which of the choices this is a seven. So let's see what happens. Let's say I start at the E, and I go to B, and then I go to D, and then let's see here, uh, I go back to E. I can do that. I just can't go over the same line twice, and then I go to C, and then I go to B again, and then I go to A, and then I go back to C. So I did this E, B, D, E, C, B, A, C. And when I do, the number I generate would be 7154623. Okay, that looks like a pretty good candidate. But let's see, can I get anything bigger? Okay, Let, let's start with E again, because I want that uh, 7. And then I'm going to go to B. The last time I went to D, so this time I'm going to go to C. And then from there, can I go anywhere? Uh, I went E, B, C, and then I'll go to E, and then D, and then B, 
and then A and then C again. So that, if I'd use that, it'll be seven, six, four, five, one, two, three. And I think that's the largest. Yeah. And you can experiment and see if you can get anything bigger, but I'm pretty confident that that's the biggest one. Al Harry has three hoses. Water flows out of each hose at this same constant rate. Using all three hoses, she starts to fill a swimming pool at 6 a.m. and calculates that the pool will be full at exactly 6 p.m. on the same day. At 11 a.m., one of the hoses unexpectedly stops working, assuming water still flows out of the other two hoses at the same rate as before. What time will the pool be full? So you have this hose, this hose, and this hose. We'll just call them hose 1, 2, and 3. And they all... Uh, fill some big pool, I guess. Right? Is it a pool? Yeah, it's a swimming pool. Okay. And uh, we are starting at 6 a.m. And uh, the pool will be full by 6 p.m. If, if uh, all three are working, I'm assuming. So that's a 12-hour period. So 12 hours. Okay. So let's give some numbers here. I think it'll make it easier. So let's say the pool has a, a 360 liters um, of, of water. I don't know if that's good or, or bad. Small pool for kids. Who knows? Anyhow, so that means that we're going to get 120 uh, from each of these. We're going to get 120 liters from that first one, second one, and third one. So the 12 hours is the time so that means 120 liters over 12 hours is the rate for each hose and that basically is 10 liters per hour for each hose so we have to now talk about the scenario that they're describing that at 11 a.m. one of the hoses stops working so until 11 a.m. Um, we've got let me just draw the three hoses again one two and three so until 11 a.m. the all three are working so the first one works from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m., so that's five hours. So five hours at that rate, so five times 10 liters per hour would be 50 liters. So we're going to get 50 liters from that first hose, and then it stops working. So now the pool is 360, so the remaining 310 have to come from this guy and this guy. So 310 divided by 2, because each of them are going to provide a equal amounts 155 correct yeah so now we have to figure out how long does it take for one hose to pump out 155 liters of water at 10 liters per hour 155 liters so that looks to me like hold on let me see if I'm doing this calculation properly uh, 10 the rate times the time would be that so the time would be 15.5 so 15.5 hours. Yeah. Okay, so basically what that means is from 6 a.m., it'll take 15.5 hours. So plus 15.5 hours. Well, 12 hours would be 6 p.m. and then another 3.5. So 9.30 p.m. is when the pool will be full. The lines with the two equations below intersect at 2, negative 3. What are the possible ordered pairs A, B? So I guess 2 and negative 3 satisfy both of those equations. So let's sub it in and see what happens. So if I put in 2 and negative 3 into the first one, this guy here, I will get um, 2A squared plus 2 and then negative 3 would make it 6b is equal to 4. So putting everything on one side, I get 2a squared plus 6b minus 2 is 0. And I guess I can divide through by 2, a squared plus 3b minus 1. So this will be my equation um, 1, I guess. And then the same thing, substitute that point 2, negative 3 into there because it satisfies it. So that would be... Uh, 
2 minus 2a and then minus 3b is 9. And then if I put everything on one side, I will get 0 is equal to 2a plus 3b plus 7. And I can call this equation 2. Now, I guess uh, i got to solve for them. If I do 1 minus 2, let's see, what does that do for me? Oh, I forgot the 0 there. That would be 0, 1 minus 2. So a squared minus 2a minus 8, correct? And I think this factors a, a, 4, 2, negative, positive. So a is either 4 or negative 2. Okay. So what am I trying to do here? In the, oh, i got to figure out the values of b. Okay, that shouldn't be a problem. So to figure out the value of b, I guess I can substitute it into uh, either one of these equations. Uh, for example, if I put it in that equation, I should be able to get it. So when a is 4, it'll be 16 plus 3b minus 1 is 0. So that means um, 3b is equal to negative 15, so b is negative 5. Correct? So the first is 4, negative 5, the first ordered pair. 4, negative 5. And then the other one is this guy. When a is negative 2, that would be a squared. Uh, hold on. Uh, a is negative 2, so let me plug that in. And my negative 2 squared plus, I'm putting it in here, plus 3b minus 1 is 0. So that's going to be uh, 4 minus 1. So 3b plus 3 is 0. So that means b is negative 1. So that's going to be negative 2, negative 1. And there you go. Those are the two uh, ordered pairs. What is the integer equal to? Let's see if we can do any factoring here. 2, 0, 2, 3, 4, that one. This 2, 0, 2, 2 is really the same as 2, 0, 2, 3, minus 1. And 2, 0, 2, 4 is 2, 0, 2, 3, plus 1. And then this 1 plus 2, 0, 2, 3 to the power of 2, I'll leave alone for now. So then now this guy, we can, uh, let's see here, 2, 0, 2, 3 squared, and then minus 1. And this is 1. Uh, let me just write it in reverse order. It makes it a little bit nicer, like that. And then let's see here. Again, this whole thing would be 2, 0, 2, 3 to the 4. And then the middle two terms would disappear and then be minus 1. And then when you do this, ooh, it looks like it's just 1. Interesting. For how many integers x is the expression equal to an integer? OK. Oh, boy. So. 75 minus x, first of all, it's under the radical, so it's got to be greater than or equal to 0. So that means 75 is greater than, x is less than 75. And the same thing holds true with the x minus 25. That's also got to be greater than or equal to 0, so x has got to be greater than 25. So the x is between 75 and 25. All right, so where do I go from here? I guess I have to make a table. I don't see any system. Maybe there is. I just don't see it. So and where n is this guy, the 75 minus x over x minus 25, all under the square root sign. The whole thing's under the square root sign. Okay, so first of all, I have to abide by this. So I've got to start choosing values of x that are at least 25. And then I've got to make these a perfect square. So I'm going to concentrate first on the first top a number, the 75 minus x. Now, our perfect squares are what? B other, uh, perfect squares below 75 are 64, 36, well, hold on, no, 49, and then 36, and then 25, 16, 9, 4, and 1. I don't think we'll get to that because we have to abide by that. But let's see what we, what we get. So I w my goal is to get that 75 minus x into one of these. Okay, so I can do that with an 11, right? But 11 is not in that range, so I can't use the 11, unfortunately. Uh, but I can use 26, and if I use 26, I'll get a 49. So let's see what happens. We get 75 minus 26, and on the bottom, it'll be 26 minus 25. 
and that would be uh, 49 over 1 and there you go that's 7 so we got an integer so this x equals 26 is a value of x for which that expression is an integer so a little bit of fiddling around okay so this one we couldn't do but this one we did okay 36 how do I get that 75 minus x into a 36 I believe I would use 39 for x so that would be 75 minus 39 and be 39 minus 25 and that looks to me like 36 over 14 okay the the numerator is good but unfortunately we've got this radical in the denominator so that, that that's not an in integer okay no problem we can just keep going here x equals 50 would give me a 25 75 minus 50 that would give me a 25 and this becomes 50 minus 25 that's 25 over 25 and that is 1. So that works out great. And I th we don't have that many more, right? We just have, uh, uh, well, uh, actually we, hmm, I think we can keep going. We have four more. Four more, okay. So hopefully I can squeeze it in. Okay. So here we go. To get the next one, we need a 59. So 75 minus 59, 59 minus 25. So that does indeed give me that uh, 16, which is what I'm looking for. But I'm, but this is unfortunately a 34. So that's not a that's not an integer. Okay, no problem. That one failed. Let's try nine. To get a nine, I would need need a 66. So 75 minus 66 over 66 minus 25. And then, therefore, that's a 9 over 41. But that, that's 3 over 41. And unfortunately, that one failed. Okay, uh, how many more do I have here? Uh, well, actually, there's one more, I think, because 0 is a perfect square, right? I mean, technically, 0 times 0 is 0. Okay, so let's just keep going. So um, 71. And I'll just let you do the math. That's going to give me... Uh, 4 over root 46, so that doesn't work. And But then 74, that would give me actually, oh, that doesn't work either. Yeah, it's going to be 1 over 7. But 75, that's going to give me 0, so that works. Okay, so I've got, how many did I, only got 3? Huh, okay. So I guess I have to come up with a couple more. Uh, so I guess now I concentrated on the first one. So now what I have to do is sort of concentrate on the whole expression. Yeah. And see if the, how I how do I get the whole expression into a perfect square? Because initially with these guys I was just looking at the numerator. So if I look at the whole expression and I do some fiddling around, I'll get thirty. Uh, that will work because it'll be 75 minus 30 over 30 minus 25 and that is going to be 45 over 5 and that's the root of 9 which is 3 so that works so we got another one and then 35 also works so that becomes 30 75 minus 35 over 35 minus 25 so that becomes 40 over 10 which is which is the root of 4, and that is equal to 2. So the ones that worked are 26, 50, 75, 30, and 35. So that's five values of x for which that expression is an integer. A positive integer is called mystical if it has at least two digits in every pair of two consecutive digits read from left to right forms a perfect square. For example, 364 is a mystical integer because 36 and 64 are bo both perfect squares. But 325 is not mystical because 32 is not a perfect square. What is the largest mystical integer? Well, first of all, let's list what are the two-digit uh, perfect squares. 16, 25... 36, 49, 64, 81, 
And there's many others, but they're not two digit because the next one would be 100, which is three digit. And if you went in the other direction, the, the previous one is nine, which is a one digit. So we only have to worry about these guys. Okay, let's start one at a time. So let's start with a 16. Can I make this number elongate? And if possible, uh, how? Uh, I can do that if I can find a perfect square that ends in this one. And there is an 81. Okay, so that's pretty good, right? Can I keep going? Is there a perfect square that ends in 8? And the answer is no. So that's as far as I can go with the 16. Now we turn our attention to 25. Can I make this, can I elongate it? And the answer is no, because there's no perfect square in my list that ends in 2. So 25 is about as far as we can go there. How about 3, 6? Can I keep going? Is there a perfect square that ends in 3? And the answer is no. So that ends right there. Now let's try 49. Is there a perfect square that ends in 4? And the answer is yes, there's a 6. 64 is what I meant to say. Okay, let's keep going. Is there a perfect square that ends in 6? There's 2, the 16 and 36. So we can have a 16, or we could have a 36. Okay, now let's go here. Is there a perfect square that ends with a 1? And the answer is yes. Is there a perfect square that ends with a 3? And the answer is no, so that ends there. And then can we keep going? Is there a perfect square that ends with an 8? And the answer is no. So this is about as far as we can go, and that's pretty big. So that's my candidate for the largest, but we've got to keep going. We've done these four. Now we've got to keep going. We've got to do the 64. Is there a perfect square that ends in 6? And the answer is yes, there is. Um... Uh, one and the three. Is there a perfect square that ends in one? Yes. Is there a perfect square that ends in three? No. And is there a perfect square that ends in eight? No. So those are my numbers. And then finally, the 81. Is there a perfect square that ends in eight? And the answer is no. So my candidates, I put boxes around them. The largest one is this guy, which would be 81649 is the largest mystical integer. In the 3x3 three three grid, there are four 2x2 two two subgrids, each of which is bordered by a thick line in one of the four grids below. Kaysen wants to place an integer from 1 to 4 inclusive in each cell of a 3x3 three three grid so that every 2x2 two two subgrid contains each integer exactly once. For example, the grid below and on the left satisfies the condition, but the grid below and on the right does not. How many ways can Kaysen place integers in the grid so that they satisfy the condition? Well, since we've already been given those four grids, let's just use them. Uh, let's use letters A, B, C, D. And those letters represent the four numbers. One, two, three, four. Not necessarily in that order, but in some order. These four will come from these four somehow. So we'll just place it. A, B, C, D. Yeah, that's pretty good. A, B, C, D. And so on. And the first four. Now, what's interesting is that we want all four of those boxes to have A, B, C, D. We want all four to have one to four in each of those two by two subgrids. So that means we've got to think about this that means these two guys like for example this guy and this guy combined with those two have to have a b c d well, now we already have c d so that means the a and the b have to go here got it or yeah th that that's right and then same same kind of story holds true here for that subgrid we already have the b and this d so the a and the c are missing so we got to put the a and the c here so that's one way of doing it. Or you can have A, B, and then C, A. It would satisfy the condition, but just the order is a little bit reversed. Or you can have B, A, and A, C. Or you can have B, A, and C, A. So those are the four ways of satisfying it. Now, of course, we have this last guy. What do we put? Okay, so if we look at this subgrid, this 2 by 2 subgrid, What's missing? Well, the A is missing. And then here, what's missing? Uh, C is missing, right? 
and then here we have the A, we don't have a B, and then here, oh, we have two A's. So this one falls apart. So this one is no good. So the only ones that work are this guy, this guy, and this guy. So we have three uh, ways of, of placing the numbers. So now we have to figure out uh, in how many ways. Well, it's three, but here's the thing. For each of them, there's multiple iterations because the A, B, C, D has different iterations, right? Because if you have A, B, C, and D, you have, you're choosing from one, two, three, and four. So you have four choices for the A. It could be either one, two, three, or four. And then you have three choices remaining for the B, two choices remaining for the C, and one choice for the D. So the total would be three, four times three times two times one, which I believe is 24. So for each of these guys, there's 24 ways of creating it. So 24, 24, and 24. So the grand total would be three times 24, which is 72. There are exactly three real numbers, x for which x minus 5 over x is the reciprocal of x minus 4. What is the sum of these three real numbers? x minus 5 over x is the reciprocal of, one over, of x minus 4, which is 1 over x minus 4. So let's make the, add that fraction. So x squared minus 5 over x is equal to 1 over x minus 4. Cross multiply, and we get x squared minus 5 times x minus 4 and therefore we're going to have x cubed minus 4x squared minus 5x plus 20 and then when we put everything on one side we'll have x to the power of 3 minus 4x squared minus 6x plus 20 all right okay so we got to do that long division stuff um, and to help you out, you guys know that the, the, the number that usually works is a divisor of that last number. So a divisor of 20 is going to work. So let's try 1. If x equals 1, that's 1 is a divisor of 20. Uh, 1 will not work. I just plugged it in and it won't. How about 2? That'll be 2 to the power of 3 minus 4 times 2 squared minus 6 times 2 plus 20. That's 8 minus uh, 4 times 4 is 16 minus 12 plus 20. And does that equal 0? It does. So x equals 2 works. So that means that one of the factors is x minus 2. x minus 2. Now what's the other stuff? Well, then uh, unfortunately we got to do that long division, which is not so bad. So let's do that. x, minus, x to the power of 3, 4x squared minus 6x plus 20 x minus 2. Okay, so this will be x squared. x squared times that is x3 minus 2x squared. Okay, then subtract it, and we get uh, minus, minus that, so minus 2x squared minus 6x plus 20. So that will be minus 2x, so that will be minus 2x squared uh, plus 4x. So that's going to be minus 10x plus 20. So that'll be minus 10. So minus 10x plus 20. And there you go. That will therefore be 0. OK, so this guy is what goes here. x squared minus 2x minus 10. OK, it's pretty good. So this equation is going to give me my answer. So x is either 2. Oh, but I got to use a quadratic. Oh. All right. So x squared minus 2x minus 10 is 0. So I got to use a quadratic. So x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of uh, b squared minus 4ac all over 2. So that's x is. 2 plus or minus um, root 44 over 2. And root 44 is what? 2 root 11. So that's x is 1 plus or minus root 11. Okay, finally we got the roots. So our roots are 2, 1 plus root 11, and 1 minus root 11. 
and they want you to find the sum of these guys. So if you add them up, you would get four because those radicals will disappear. In triangle ABC, AB is 8, BC is 11, AC is 6. The points P and Q are on BC such that triangle BPA and triangle QAC are each similar to ABC. What is the length of PQ? Well, let's take this one step at a time. Let's uh, first just concentrate on the first triangle PBA. Yeah, this one right here, PBA. And let's label some angles here. Uh, this one I'll call theta. And this one I'll call alpha. Now, they are saying that triangle PBA is similar to triangle ABC, the big guy. Okay, so if that's the case, this angle and this angle have to be the same as the angles of the big guy. So this angle right here obviously cannot be alpha, so it's got to be something else. So I'll just call it gamma. And then this angle inside here, this little one, that therefore has to be alpha. And then therefore the big guy the one that goes all the way across like that has to be the gamma. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's right. So if that's the case, then we can use the, the ratio of the sides that AB over BC is the same as AP over AC, and that's the same as BP over AB. So we've been given some values, so let's plug those in. So 8 over 11 is the same as AP over 6 is the same as BP over 8, right? So using this, we can calculate that AP would be 8 times 6 over 11. So that's 48 over 11. And we using this and this, we can calculate that BP would be 64 over 11. Okay, so BP is 64 over 11. That, and I think that's basically the way to go. Now let me draw this again because otherwise it would make the diagram way too messy. And this time concentrate on the QAC, this guy. So this guy right here. So we have Q, A, and C that triangle. So again, let's label this. If that's, if that's theta and that's alpha, the angles all have to be the same because they're saying that triangle QAC is similar to that triangle ABC. So if that's the case, this angle can't be alpha. So I'm going to call it, well actually I don't know what, what it's going to be called, but this angle actually uh, that I'm going to just call it gamma, and therefore this has to be theta. And then the, this whole thing would therefore be gamma. Is that right? Yeah, pretty sure. Let me just see if I did that right. Theta, alpha, gamma for ABC, and then theta, alpha, and gamma. Okay, I think that's right. So now again, same thing. We use the comparisons of the sides, AB over AQ. BC over AC and AC over QC. And then we plug in whatever values we have. 8 over AQ, 11 over 6. BC is 11, AC is 6, right? Yeah. And then 6 over QC. And then from this, we can get QC using those two. That QC would be 36 over 11. So 36 over 11. And then what they want us to figure out PQ, right? So PQ is really the whole thing, which is BC, which is 11, minus BP, which is 64 over 11, minus QC, which is 36 over 11. Yeah. So that is basically 11 minus uh, 64 plus 36 over 11. So that's 11, 11 minus 100 over 11. 
So then if I get a common den denominator, it'd be 121 minus 100 over 11, and that's 21 over 11 is the value for p cubed. Square ABCD has A and B on the x-axis and C and D below the x-axis on the parabola with equation y is equal to x squared minus 4. What is the area of ABCD? Let's label this as best as we can. This is y is equal to x squared minus 4. So when y is 0, x squared minus 4 is 0, so therefore x would be x squared would be 4, and therefore x would be plus or minus 2. And, uh, I don't know if that helps us in any way, but let's just put that. That's 2, and this is negative 2. When x is 0, y would be negative 4. So that means this down here is negative 4, that, that point right there. Okay, now let's, what else can we do here? Hmm. This point C, I'm just going to call it x, y for now. So that means the distance from here to here is x. So the distance from there to there is x, because it's a square, right? So if that's x, then that means by symmetry that's x. So that's x, and that's x right there. And then how about b to c, that top to, top to bottom? That's the y coordinate, so that's y. Well, it's actually, it's the absolute value of y, actually, because I think y would be negative, so they have to take the absolute value. But y is equal to x squared minus 4. So it would really be the absolute value of x squared minus 4. Okay, I think that's all we need. I think we can do it. Because the area of ABCD is basically this the side squared, right? Well, the side is from here to here, right? From there to there is 2x. And then the side from top to bottom is this guy. The absolute value of that, so it would be reversed. It would be 4 minus x squared, correct? Because x, the way I've drawn it, is less than that 2. So therefore, it would be 4 minus x squared. And they're saying, what is the area? Okay, that's the area, but that's in terms of x, though. Hmm. Ah, okay, okay, I got it. The, the sides are the same, so this side is the same as that side. So that means 2x is the same as 4 minus x squared. Ah, okay, okay, that's how you figure out the value for x, and then you plug it back into here. Okay, okay. So the x squared plus 2x minus 4 is 0. Does this factor? Unfortunately, it does not. Okay, well, that makes it harder. No problem, you're going to have to use a quadratic, so x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2. So that's uh, minus 2 plus or minus, what is that, uh, 20? Yeah, all over 2. So that's minus 2 plus or minus uh, 2 root 5. So that means we have minus 1 plus or minus root 5. So we'll, we'll obviously use the positive value of x. So that would be root 5 minus 1. Yeah, root 5 minus 1. Okay, so we have the value for x. So just plug it into there. So that's going to be, um, actually, you can just use 2x squared. I don't think we even need to do that because the one side is 2x. And just square it to get the, the area. It would be a little bit easier, I think. So that's 4x squared. And then x is this guy right here. So root 5 minus 1, all squared. So that's going to be 5 minus 2 root 5 plus 1. So that's going to be 6, right? So 6 times 4 is 24 minus 8 root 5. 24 minus 8 root 5 is the answer to the question, yeah. Let a equal log of 9 to the base 4 and b equal log of 8 to the base 3 times 108. What is the integer equal to a times b under the square root? Okay, so we're going to have to use some log rules. Which ones? I'm not sure yet, but um, 
sooner or later we're gonna have to use a log rule so let's start with this guy and then we'll continue with that guy so I'll just take it one step at a time I guess so a is log of 9 to the 4 now eventually we have to multiply them together so I think it'd be helpful if we get the same base now how do we get the same base can I get base 3 in this? Because this has base 3, right? I think I can. Because this was 3 squared. And then using log rules, it just put the 2 out front, right? Hmm. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay, okay, I got it. There's a log rule that states that the log of b to the base a is equal to 1 over the log of a to the base b. So this guy right here is just the equivalent of 1 over the log of 4 to the base 3. So there we go. We got something with base 3, and that's exactly what I wanted. So that's it, I think. Or we can, we can keep going. So this is going to be 2 over the log. Uh, let's convert that 4 to 2 squared. And that would then allow me to bring the 2 out front. And then that would then allow me to just get rid of those two, so it would be just the log of 2 to the base 3. Okay, so that's about as far as I can go there. So that's A. Okay, now let's concentrate on this guy, B. B is already in base 3, so that's very helpful. Log of 8 to the base 3. Now let's see what I can do. That 8 is 2 to the power of 3, right? So using log rules, we can bring that 3 out front. Oh, oh, why did I put log? I should put 108. So 108, and then that 3 will come out front, and then be log to the 2 of base 3. So that's, uh, well, whatever that is, uh, uh, 324. Log of 2 to the base 3. Okay, and that's about as far as that goes. So now we can go back and concentrate on that guy. So let's do that. So a, b, so we have a, which is 1 over the log of 2 to the base 3 times 324 times the log of 2 to the base 3, and then everything under the square root sign. Well, this cancels with that, so then we just have 324 under the square root sign, and that is 18. So there you go, 18 is the answer. Jolene and Tia are playing a two-player game at a carnival. In one bin, there are five red balls, numbered 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25. In another bin, there are 25 green balls, numbered 1 through 25. In the first stage of the game, Jolene chooses one of the red balls at random. Next, the carnival worker removes the green ball with the same number as the ball Jolene chose. Tia then chooses one of the 24 remaining balls at random. Jolene and Tia win if the number on the ball chosen by Tia is a multiple of 3. What is the probability that they win? So I'm assuming that it's just a one-shot deal, that the, de that the game does not continue if they lose with the remaining balls. The, the, you understand what I'm saying? Like, they just get one shot at it. But this, this sentence is confusing in the first stage of the game. So is there a second stage? Ugh. Oh boy. Well, let me just do the question as if it's just a one-shot deal. That they just get one chance, they either win or lose. Okay. So we got 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25, right? And those are the uh, balls in the red bin. So this is the red bin. And then we have uh, the green bin, which is a much bigger bin. And it's one, two, three, and then so on. I'm not going to write them all out. Uh, or maybe should I write them all out? Okay, maybe I'll write them all out. What the heck? It won't take that long. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. And then 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Okay, that didn't take so long. And this is the green bin. All right, so now let's, let's discuss this. If we have, uh, well, I think we only have five scenarios, right? We have Jolene 
either picks a 5, a 10, a 15, a 20, or a 25. There's only five possible choices that she could have picked from. And if that's the case, then the carnival, who's the guy? It's some guy, um, Jolene, and then the carnival worker. Okay, so CW, carnival worker. He then chooses the matching ball. So, for example, if, if she picks the red uh, five, he would then choose the green five. And similarly, the green 10, and so on. And then we have to figure out what is the probability of Tia. Tia then goes next, I think. And she's going to choose from the green bin, correct? Tia then chooses one of the 24 remaining green balls. Okay. And then if it's a multiple of three, both of them win. They both win. All right, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, so let's first circle... Uh, what are the multiples of 3 in the green bin? So we got 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, and 24. Those are the multiples of green. And let's take this one step at a time. So if you have this first scenario, 5 and 5, the 5 is out. So what is the probability of getting a multiple of 3? We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 multiples of 3 out of 24, right? Because one of those has already been taken out. And it's at that 5. Okay, I'm pretty sure that 8 over 24 is correct. Let's go to the next one. If 10 is taken out, I think the probability is the same. If the 15 is taken out, aha, now the probability drops down to 7 over 24 since the 15 has already been taken out. Okay. And then for 20, I think it's 8 over 24. And the 25 also 8 over 24. So we have to combine these probabilities. Now, the probability of each of those happening is 1 over 5, right? Because it all depends on that. And there's a 1 over 5 chance of getting uh, this guy, this guy, and so on. Each of those had equal probability of being chosen. So then the total probability would be 1 over 5 times that 8 over 24 plus the 1 over 5 times the 8 over 24 plus the 1 over 5 times the 7 over 24. And you guys get the point. 1 over 5 times 8 over 24. And then finally, the last one, times 8 over 24. And when you do that, we get a common denominator. It'll be, uh, let's see here, uh, 32 plus 7 over 120. And that's going to be 39 over 120. And that is 13 over 40. In lowest terms, 13 over 40. The positive integer D has the property that each of 468, 636, and 867 has the same remainder R when divided by D was the largest possible value of D plus R. 468 over the, if you divide by it, right, it's going to give you some integer with a remainder of r. Yeah, remainder of r. And the same story holds true for 636. If you divide it by d, it'll be some other integer with a remainder of r. And then 867 divided by d is, again, that story. So if we make these into equations, it'll be 468 is equal to I1D plus R. Uh, 636 is I2D plus R. And then 867 is I3D plus R. Let's call this equation 1. Let's call this equation 2. And let's call that equation 3. Okay. Oh, boy. All right, so then I want to kind of discuss this. So if I take equation 2 and minus equation 1, I will get 168 is equal to I2 minus I1 times D. The R's disappear. And then similarly, if I take 3 minus 1, I would get 399 is equal to I3 minus I1 times D. And then 3 minus 2 would get 231 is equal to I3 
minus I2 times D. So that shows me that D is a divisor of these numbers. It's a divisor of 168, one, it's a divisor of 399, and it's also a divisor of 231. So let's explore those numbers to get a little bit of an idea of what D could be, because D has to be a common divisor then of all three. So let's break it down into, into its prime factors. 168 is 2 to the power of 3 times 3 times 7. 399 is 3 times 7 times 19. And 231 is 3 times 7 times 11. So we have to talk about what are the common divisors of those three numbers. 1, that's a common divisor. There's a 3 in all three of them. There's a 7 in all three of them. And there's a 21 also in all three of them. So those are our candidates for D. So let's make a little table, D, R, and D plus R. Yeah, let's see what we get. So 1, 3, 7, and 21. Okay, so how do we calculate uh, R? We have, to, oh, we have to go back to these guys here. So we have to take uh, 468, 636 and 867, divide them by D, and then see what is the remainder. And for the first one, the remainder is 0, so D plus R would be 1. When D is 3, you will get the remainder is again 0, so then this would be 3. When 7, the remainder is actually 6, and therefore that would be 13. And then for 21, the remainder is 6, so that would be 27. And if I recall, they want the largest possible value for D plus R, so the largest possible value for D plus R is 27. Square A, B, C, D has center O, points P and Q are on A, B, R and S are on B, C, C and T, U are on C, D, and V, W are on A, D as shown. Triangle A, P, W, triangle B, R, Q, triangle C, T, S, and triangle D, V, U are isosceles, and triangle P, O, W, a triangle R, O, Q, uh, triangle TOS and triangle VOU are equilateral. What is the ratio of triangle PQO to BRQ? PQO to triangle BRQ. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give them letters here, M and N, just to kind of make it a little bit simpler. Uh, and I have to do a lot of labeling here. So from Q to B, I'm going to call that X. And there's something about isosceles in here. Which ones are isosceles? Uh, BRQ. BRQ is isosceles, right? So that means this is X also, then B to R. Okay. And then there's something about equilateral, that one. So which ones are equilateral? Q, ROQ, this one. So that means this guy is a equilateral. So let's just call it Y. So that's Y, that's Y, and that's Y. Okay, and then PQO, I'm going to draw it on the side here, because otherwise it'll make the diagram a little too messy. It's kind of like this, right? This is P, this is Q, and this is O. And if I draw a line top to bottom like that, I believe that's, hmm, let me think about this here. I don't have a dimension for the square. So I'm, I don't, they didn't tell me. So I'm just going to call it 10. Because I think in the end, because it's a ratio, it won't matter. So if that's x and that's x, that means pq would be 10 minus 2x. Is that right? Yeah, 10 minus 2. So 10 minus 2x would be there. And then the, the top to bottom height, that would be... 5, right? Because it would be just half of the side length. Okay. I'm pretty sure that that is the case. So I can figure out areas for all of these guys. So the total area, total area, of the, the big square, the entire square, A, B, C, D, if the side length is 10, would be 10 times 10, right? So that's 100. But the total area can also be calculated with those shapes. So how many do we have? Of the PQO types, we've got four of those guys. So four PQ, 
O triangles, right? I hope you can see that. And then we have of the Q O R, we got four of those. And then of the uh, Q B R, however they're calling it, Q B R, we got four of those. And then we can sub in and then solve. Okay, no problem. So the total is 100. P Q O, that would be 1 half base times height. So this is the guy. So the base is 10 minus 2x. And the height is 5. But then remember, there's four of those guys. So we got to put a 4 there. Yeah. And then 4 times QR. QOR, oh, that's an isosceles. You guys remember the how to figure out, sorry, not isosceles, equilateral. Do you know how to figure out the area of an equilateral triangle that has side length of something, x or y? It's uh, root 3 over 4 y squared. So that would be root 3 over 4 y squared. Yeah. Is that right? Let me just see if I did that right. Yeah. And then finally, this QBR, well, that's easy. That's just 1 half base times height. So 4 times 1 half x times x. And I think that's it. Let me just see if I did that correctly. 100, and then uh, 4. Oh, yeah, I, I did include the 4. That's good. 4 times 1 half base times height. Then 4 times the root 3 over 4 y squared. Then 4 times 1 half base times height. Okay. The only problem is we've got x's and y's, but that's not too big of a problem because if you look at that triangle QBR, it's it's a right triangle, so that means we can get x in terms of y, because x squared plus x squared using Pythagoras is y squared, so y squared is actually two x squared. So we can sub that in there. Okay. So one hundred is uh, twenty. So ten. Uh, so ten. So be one hundred minus twenty x. And then this is going to be plus root three y squared, which is two x squared. And then this would be 2x squared. OK, so that worked out really nicely. These hundreds actually disappear. So then we have minus 20x plus, uh, hold on here, something. I think that x squared I can factor out. And that'll be 2 root 3 plus 2. Yeah. So they'll put the 20x on this side, x squared, 2 root 3 plus 2. And then the x can divide through, so 20 would be x, 2 root 3 plus 2. And then finally, the x would be 20 over 2 root 3 plus 2. And I think you can divide top and bottom by 2 to root 3 plus 1. 10 over root 3 plus 1. OK, so what are we trying to figure out again? Uh, this one. So x was 10 over root 3 plus 1. Is that right? Yeah. OK, so this, I, I don't even know why I wrote M and N. It's not even relevant. I just thought I'd have to label it, but I didn't really need to. So PQO was 1 half base times height. So that's 10 minus 2x times 5. Correct? And then the BRQ, that's 1 half base times height. So that's just um, x squared, right? Yeah, x times x. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. OK, so then we have to, let me simplify it first. So it'll be 50 minus 10x over x squared. Okay, so then I gotta substitute this guy. Okay, so I need a little bit of space for that. So 50 minus 10 times 10 over root 3 plus 1, all over root, ooh, what is this? 10 over root 3 plus 1, all squared. Okay, so this will be. Um, 
uh, 50 times root 3 plus 1 minus 100 over root 3 plus 1. And this will be root 3 plus 1 all squared over 100, right? And when you invert and multiply like that. So uh, this will be 50 root 3 minus 50. Yeah, and then this this will cancel. One of these guys will cancel with that, so it'll just be root 3 plus 1. And then the 100, I think, not much we can do at that point. Uh, okay, so let's expand this now. Uh, let me get rid of that 100. So it would be root 3 minus 1 over 2, and the root 3 plus 1. So that's going to be 3. The middle two terms will cancel out minus 1 over 2. So that's 2 over 2, which is 1 over 1. Huh, okay. The ratio is 1 to 1. And that completes the question. The sequence A1, A2, A3 is an arithmetic sequence with the common difference 3, and A1 is equal to 1. The sequence B1, B2, B3, and so on, is an arithmetic sequence with common difference 10, and B1 equal to 2. What is the smallest integer larger than 2, 0, 2, 3 that appears in both sequences? So A1, A2, and so on, that is of the form 1, and then 1 plus 3, which is 4, 1 plus 2 times 3, which would be 7, and then so on. So 10, 13, and 16, and so on. So it's of the form 1 plus 3k. The second one, b1, b2, b3, and so on, dot, dot, dot. That is, uh, the first term is 2, and then the common difference is 10, so that would be 12, 22, 32, and so on. So that's of the form, uh, sorry, 2 plus 10n. Correct? And they're saying that there's some integer eventually that's larger than 2, 0, 2, 3 that appears in both. So eventually that 1 plus 3k will equal that 2 plus 10n. Okay. So let's solve for n. So that's going to be 3k minus 1 over 10 is n. And then, since all these terms are of the form 1 plus 3k, 1 plus 3k has to be larger than 2, 0, 2, 3. So that means 3k is larger than 2, 0, 2, 2. So k is greater than 674. So I think we just have to make a table and see what happens, starting with 675 for k. And then we'll see what is 1 plus 3k. And then we'll see what is n. And then we'll see what is the 2 plus 10n. And if they match, and they're both integers, then everything will be fine. Because k and n also have to be integers, by the way. OK, so 675, we get 2026. n would be 202.4. OK, so that falls apart because n has to be an integer. Keep going, 676. That makes it 2027. Okay, that's no good. 677. 203. Okay, that works. That makes this 2032, and that makes this 2032, and there we go. So 2032 is the answer to this question. In triangle ABC, AB is 10, and sine of 3A plus 3 sine C is 4. What is the length of the altitude from C to AB? So we've got some triangle. I don't know what it looks like. we got A, B, C, and the only thing we know is that AB is equal to 10. All right, so not much information there. And what do they want? They want the altitude from C to AB, so they want this when that's a right angle. Okay, we'll just call it H for now. So let's work with this guy, sine of 3A plus 3 
plus 3 sine of C is 4. Now you guys remember the, the sine graph, right? It kind of goes on like this, right? Where the, the largest value is 1 and the smallest value is negative 1. So that's, let's say, x, and that's the sine of x. Well, they're saying that the sine of this plus 3 times the sine of this is 4. Now, if you think about that carefully, the only way that's going to be possible is if the sine of 3a is maximum, which is the 1, is the maximum value for the sine of something. And also, the sine of c is also maximum. That's the only way that this would become 4. So that is what I'm going to go with. So this basically tells me that c is 90, right? Because when, when 90 degrees is when the sine of something is... One. I mean, there's other values, but obviously in a triangle, you're not going to put bigger values. So that means this is actually a right angle. Okay, that's very helpful. And then the sine of A, 3A is 1, so that means that 3A is 90. So that means A is 30. So that means this guy is 30. So that's 30, then that's 60. And you always remember the ratio of the sides of a 30, 60, 90 triangle r2 root 3 and 1 so um, what are we trying to figure out here uh, h so I guess hmm. um, okay so if that's 10 then that means this side would be 5, and this side would be 5 root 3, based on the ratios. So then I can just use trigonometry on this triangle to figure out h. I'll just use the sine. Sine of 30 would be opposite over hypotenuse, right? And the sine of 30 is a half, so that's h over 5 root 3. So h is equal to 5 root 3 over 2. And I think that's it. The real numbers x, y, and z satisfy both of these equations. x plus y plus z is 2. x, y plus y, z plus x, z is 0. Let a be the minimum possible value of z, b be the maximum possible value of z. What is the value of b minus a? Well, let's see here. Uh, this equation, uh, not much I can do there, but this equation, let's, hmm. Well, the first equation, I, I guess I could square it. Because if I square it, I can get some terms that look like that. So this, if I square it and I kind of collect like terms, I'll get that plus 2 times the whole xy plus yz plus xz. And that's going to be 4. Now this is this guy, and that's 0. So that means that x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to 4. So very quickly I can get that. And then where do I go from here? And then I guess I have to revisit this top guy. x plus y plus z is 2. So x plus y is equal to 2 minus z. And then if I revisit this guy, x, y is equal to minus z times x plus y. And then since x, y is 2 minus z, I'll just sub that, substitute that there, 2 minus z like that. And I think that is about as far as I can go there. Because we're, we're concentrating on z. That's why I wanted to get everything in terms of z. Yeah. Now I've got to figure out the max and min of z. Okay, so how do I do that? Well... If you take, say, x and y, right, and you square them, anything that is squared is going to be greater than or equal to 0. And if you expand that, it's going to be x squared minus 2xy plus y squared is greater than or equal to 0. So that means x squared plus y squared is greater than or equal to 2xy. Now, we can add a z squared to both sides, like that, and then this this guy right here we 
had just figured out was 4. So that means that 4 can go there, and then this we had just figured out was that, so we can plug that in 2 minus z plus z squared like this. So we have 4 is greater than, let's expand this, so that's going to be minus 4z and then plus 2z squared plus z squared. And let's put everything on one side. So it's going to be 3z squared minus 4z minus 4. Okay. So if we have some, this is the graph, let's say. This is z and this is the, the function. And this opens upward. So I don't know how it opens, but um, let's just say it, it's something like this. We want, basically, this graph to be less than 0. So we want it to be in this area. So we have to figure out, I guess, those two points. And that would, be, of course, be the max of z. And this, of course, would be the min of z, for which this is true. And I guess that's done via quadratic, right? To figure, we're basically trying to figure out the roots. Okay, so that would mean z would be minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared uh, minus 4ac all over 2a, which would be 6. So z would be 4 plus or minus 54 plus 16, so that's 80. Right? Yeah. Over 6. So oh, root 80, sorry. Okay, and, and I, I think I messed up there. Uh, it's not 80. It's going to be uh, 48 plus 64. Oh, okay, that's better. That's actually a perfect square, so that works out very nicely. 4 plus or minus 8 over 6. So 4 plus 8 is 12. 12 divided by 6 is 2. 4 minus 8 is minus 4. Minus 4 divided by 6 is minus 2 over 3. Okay, so that means this guy is the minus 2 over 3, and this guy is the 2, and this is the max, this is the min. And what do they want? They want b minus a. So a was the min and b was the max. So this is the b and this was the a. So b minus a would be 2 minus minus 2 over 3. So that looks to me like uh, 3 and 3, so 8 over 3. Let f at x be the function with the property that f at x plus f at x minus 1 over 3 x minus 2 is equal to x for all real numbers x other than 2 over 3. What is the sum of f at 0 plus f at 1 plus f at 2? Well, let's see. Let's start with x equals 1 and see what happens with this guy here. That's going to be f at 1 plus f at 0 is equal to 1. Okay, well, that actually is the first two terms of what we want. So it looks like that's 1. So if I can just figure out the value of f of 2, I'm in business. So let's start with x equals 2. Then I plug that back into my original equation, and that's going to be f at 2 plus f at, uh, it's going to be 1 over 4 is equal to 2. Okay, not much I can do there, so I'll just leave that for now. Now, I've got to somehow get a quarter in there, so let's plug that into there. So, f of a quarter, and that's gonna, that math is going to come out to be 3 over 5, and that's going to be a quarter. So we'll call that equation 2. And then I've got a 3 over 5, so I've got to somehow figure out f of 3 over 5. Again, plugging into there, f of 3 over 5, and then when you plug it into this guy, it's going to come out to be 2, interestingly. And that's going to be 3 over 5. Okay, so I've got three equations. I think I should be able to solve this. If I add 1 and 3, 
I will get uh, 2 f at 2, and then I'll get f at a quarter, and I'll have the f at uh, 3 over 5, and that will be 13 over 5. Call that equation 4. And then if I were to take equation 4 and subtract from it equation 2, this guy, I'll get the following. I'll get, um, let's see here, let me, what, what do I get here? These guys disappear, so I'll just get 2f at 2. And it'll be 13 over 5 minus a quarter. So 13 over 5 minus a quarter, that will be, let's see here, 4, 4, 5, 5, 52 minus 5, which is 47 over 20 is 2f at 2. So f at 2 would be 47 over 40. So going back to here, the f at 0 plus f at 1, that I got was 1. And then f at 2 I just got was 47 over 40. So that would be 40 and 40. So that would be 87 over 40 as my final answer.